These days, Ireland is pretty stable. But for most of the past hundred years, it's been more than a little unstable. Many of you know about the Troubles and maybe even 1916. But what very few people outside Ireland know is how Ireland became part of the UK in the first place. Let's just say it wasn't peaceful. We're in Ireland in the 18th century and life is fun and free for everyone. The rest of the world is having revolutions, but not our island. Okay, there are huge famines and the population doubled between 1767 and 1800. But apart from that, it was all fine and dandy. So that's not true either. Ireland isn't exactly free. Sure, it has its own parliament at College Green in Dublin, but there's an elephant in the room, or a country that has a colony with a whole lot of elephants in it. Yes, Britain. Britain lets that parliament do what it wants, so long as it's roughly what Britain wants. Okay, but it's a pretty equal society, surely. Not if you're Catholic, it isn't. It all started after the Williamite War in 1689, which follows the glorious revolution in Britain. Catholic James II has been deposed in England and Scotland by his Protestant daughter Mary and her husband William of Orange. James manages to get away, and as many have done before and since, uses Ireland as a base to try to take Britain back. In short, many Catholics side with James, thinking that there might be some benefits for them if he wins. He doesn't. So there are consequences for the Catholics. No land and no votes. Nearly all the MPs in the Irish Parliament are landlords, and 95% of land is owned by 5,000 Protestant families. Bear in mind the population is between 2.5 and 5 million. Roughly 80% of those people were Catholic, yet virtually none of them own any land. So yikes, pretty unequal. As most people forget the war, some of that attitude to Catholics goes away but not all of the laws do. And so it was still worse to be Catholic, and that started to anger them, naturally. The population is constantly growing. Famines happen. Very few people own land. Add to this, life is changing and fast. The Industrial Revolution means that more goods are produced in Ireland. Those goods need new roads to move them around. For the average person, life is already hard. And now there are constant taxes and charges that need to be paid in the name of progress. Secret societies like the Right Boys, the Hearts of Oak and the White Boys start to pop up. Members of those groups and others damage their landlord's property, send them threatening letters and kill their farm animals. And in places where Catholics and Protestants mix, like Armagh, which also has a lot of people, issues start to split along religious lines and the secret societies are turning violent. This is the Battle of the Diamond in Armagh. It's between the Protestant Peeper Day Boys and the Catholic Defenders. But why are they fighting? The Defenders want life to go back to the old ways. They don't want to be in poverty. They were also Masonic, which means they're more open to what's happening outside of their local area, or even outside of Ireland, in places like the Americas and France, for instance. Just two random places that won't be mentioned in the rest of this story. They start as mostly Catholic, but their message finds people regardless of their religion. But back in Ulster and Armagh, it's still majority Catholic. The Peeper Day Boys don't like that Catholics are taking the new jobs that are popping up. Anyway, the Peeper Day Boys win the battle and reorganise to become the Orange Order. You know, after William of Orange beat Catholic James II? To put it lightly, Ireland is becoming a little chaotic. What are all these landlord Irish MPs doing about it? The thing they really care about is how independent the Irish Parliament is from the British one. So in many ways, they did nothing about the chaos. As we saw with the Williamite War, what happened in Britain could affect what happened in Ireland. It was also becoming clearer in this larger colonial world that what happened thousands of miles away could affect them too. It's the late 1770s and the American Revolution is happening. We know that Ireland is not stable, but the British need to remove some troops just for a minute so they can teach those pesky Americans a lesson they won't forget. This gives Ireland a glimpse of what happens when Britain isn't so focused on it, but the fear of the Catholic majority hasn't gone away. Some want to make sure they stayed in their place. Plus, what if while the British cat was away, the French mouse invaded Ireland. This was a constant fear. Simple, they create volunteer companies, basically a mini volunteer army. Legally, even Catholics can join, but they are often excluded in reality. These groups are a huge deal. Are you middle class and want to show you're important? Sign up. Although a government idea, these groups of volunteers were kind of a problem for them. Sure, they both wanted to protect Ireland. They had that in common, but that's where the similarities ended. 
Maybe one day they will go in a different direction to each other. Who can say? Anyway, we all know the British lose to the Americans, and it realises that everyone in Ireland is a bit pissed off, so they kind of make the Irish Parliament independent. It can pass whatever laws it wants. But Britain has a veto, just in case. They use it sometimes. Also, the volunteers stick around. Still, Britain pressures the Irish Parliament to give Catholics full rights. They don't. But if you were somehow wealthy as a Catholic, and you couldn't get help from the Irish Parliament, you went over their heads and spoke to Big Daddy Britain. Then, the Protestants call you disloyal. In 1793, the British decide there's no point in waiting around for the Irish Parliament to do something. It forces them to give voting rights to some Catholics, anyone who earns more than 40 shillings. I honestly have no idea what that equates to. They still couldn't sit in the Irish Parliament though, and given how reluctantly the Irish Parliament had given them this small sliver of a right, resentment started to grow amongst the Catholics. Oh, we're in 1793. I completely breezed past the start of the French Revolution. 1791 is when the French Revolution really got going. And this is the Society of the United Irishmen. It started in 1791 in Belfast. Coincidence? I think not. They want some good old constitutional reform. A taste of what the French were getting. This new constitution should have some nice things like freedom for Catholics, less influence from Britain, etc. The society spreads to Dublin within months, but as things are progressing in France, taking a turn for the murderous, should we say, the British reaction to it gets stronger and stronger. The last thing they want is a homegrown or Irish revolution to deal with. And here we have a lesson of how trying to prevent something can sometimes cause it to happen. Remember the volunteers? Well, they get broken up in 1793. Where do they all go? The radical ones will be back. Then the British crack down on radical groups like the Society of United Irishmen and ban them in 1794. This is Wolf Tone. He's the president of the Catholic Committee, a group trying to get more Catholic influence in the society. Meanwhile, he's in touch with some of those lovely revolutionaries in France. Robespierre and co. send a little boat of soldiers to help him out. But classic British and Irish weather means the sea is too rough and they go home. But did Wolf Tone think Britain wouldn't notice? Chaos is everywhere. The British crack down. They have spies. They'll arrest and execute you if they find out you're part of the society. In 1798, nothing is getting better. So Britain declares martial law. People are scared and start to leave the society. Those left behind have a decision to make. They're losing people, and if they don't go for it now, will they ever have another chance? But even if they do go for it, will the spies have them arrested before they can do anything? They take the risk and go for it. The radical volunteers are on the revolutionary side. There are big bloody battles, including Killala Bay, County Mayo, where a French force manages to land and fight in August. They win, and then immediately lose. It's a violent summer. But by the end of that summer, 30,000 people are dead and the British have largely taken control again. What about those society members who weren't already dead? Some small groups look for revenge, killing British soldiers. The British take it on the chin and do nothing in retaliation. Joke, they obs go tit for tat and kill society members. On top of that, 150,000 people are sentenced to flogging, being sent to a convict colony, hello Australia, or even sentenced to death. This 1798 uprising is one of the most traumatic events in Irish history, and despite the society being set up to try and bring Irish people together, they are now more divided than ever. As a reward, Britain forces them into the United Kingdom of Britain and Ireland in 1801. The long road to 1916 has begun. So Ireland is part of the UK, and it was partially the responsibility of people who were inspired by the French Revolution. But what was to blame for the French Revolution itself being so long and bloody? Watch this, and you'll find out. <laughs>